Hey everyone, welcome to Rethink Reviews. I'm Jonathan Kim. And now for our segment, Do Yourself a Favor, we have the documentary Super Jaime. No, it's not about a Jewish superhero. It's uh, based on the comedy of Doug Benson. Doug Benson, who is a stand-up comic, I think was ranked the number two uh, pot comedian in America. He had a joke one time about the movie Super Size Me, uh, Morgan Spurlock's film where he eats McDonald's food for 30 days straight, saying that he would like to do Super High Me, where he just smokes tons of pot for 30 days. A director uh, who was in the audience heard this joke and said, hey, why don't we make that a movie? So, uh, so they did. But what was interesting about this movie, it was different from what I thought it was going to be. It's not just Doug Benson getting high for 30 days. Half the movie is about him not smoking for 30 days. Part of the, uh, of the concept of the movie would be that before he smoked for 30 days straight, literally smoking as much as he can from the second he woke up right until he went to sleep, but that First, he has to go sober for 30 days. And you watch that process as well for a guy who's a, daily, who's a daily stoner and it is part of the comedy that he does. They test mental functions, health, weight, like all, all, all these other things, even whether uh, pot increases psychic abilities. So anyway, I watched it the other day. It is, a, it is an entertaining and educational movie. It does talk about uh, the state of pot dispensaries in Los Angeles. And stick around after the clip for our other regular segment, Movies That Matter. But until then, here is a clip from Super Jaime. So today is your first week of being back on pot. So how are you doing? Um, great. I'm <laughs> it's kind of a uh, little bit back to normal. It seems like it's fairly important for you to communicate to me that marijuana doesn't change you very much. Like, you really want me to hear that message. Yeah, it probably sounds defensive, too, a little bit, like... Yeah, I'm the same guy, either, you know, either way. Would you mind if I smoked pot before our sessions? Really? I'm just asking <laughs> how you would feel if I were to do it. I guess it would depend on how it, how it changes you. Who knows, you might seem more interested in me if you were high. Since we're on kind of a natural nature sort of vibe for this show, uh, for our Movies That Matter segment, uh, I decided to have a clip from Taggart Siegel and John Betts. They are the co-producers of the movie uh, Queen of the Sun, What Are the Bees Telling Us? It's a documentary about honeybees, something that, uh, that most people don't know about, mostly because people don't like bees and think that they sting you all the time. Uh, honeybees actually don't do that. That's more of a yellow jacket sort of thing. Uh, you'd find that out in the movie. But uh, it's a really interesting movie about colony collapse disorder, uh, where honeybees are suddenly disappearing and also looks at the importance that honeybees uh, have in our lives in terms of the food we eat, which is most of it. If, uh, without honeybee pollination, we wouldn't have basically all of the fruits and vegetables and many of the grains that we enjoy so much. So anyway, I asked uh, John and Taggart about what are some movies that really kind of inspired them, changed the way they thought about the world, and got them into making a movie like Queen of the Sun. So here, for Movies That Matter, is Taggart Siegel and John Betts of Queen of the Sun. Just wondering if there were sort of formative movies for you that made you decide, you know, I want to, you know, either educated you on something or made you think, I want to make those kind of movies that can affect that, you know, some kind of positive change. Well, for me, I'm a lot older than he. I'm 52. So <laughs> we didn't really have a lot of social documentaries when I was 20. So it's a really a new phenomenon where these films that started coming out in the 90s, environmental films, there were very, very powerful, like, you know, Inconvenient Truth and all those. I mean, that was in 2000. But there, there was a big movement that really, I think, shows that people really care about these issues and the in media doesn't give us the truth about things. And so film is the perfect medium for that. But in the early 90s, I did see a film. I don't even know what the name of it is. But it was on nuclear watches that were made in, I think it was in, Ohio, it was a factory, and the women were working on a lot of the watches in 1920s that have radiation in it, and so they used to like paint the watch heads, you know, with the, with the radiation, and then they would lick the the paintbrush that they were using, or they would during Halloween they would like paint themselves so they would glow in the dark and stuff, and it turns out that of course all of these people were dying like radiation sickness and the the corporation or, or the factory refused to say that it had anything to do with the radiation and so this whole you know this is like now in early 1990s showing how this town 
like the factory, they go back to where the factory used to stand and they had the Geiger counter and it was just like high radiation. And you go into the old houses where people used to live and you go up the railings and the Geiger counter would go nuts. And so it was one of those kind of pre-environmental films that I, I saw like, well, wow, these are the these are the things that are in, in the injustices of, 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 of humans. And so, I mean, I think films like um, Blue Vinyl, you know, Judas film, um, is an example of how to use humor to get a point across, like these vinyl sightings on houses, how in the factories, you know, it creates incredible toxins and people are dying of cancer. Or, and vinyl is supposedly just one of the worst substances on earth. But she uses a lot of humor. She's trying to convince her parents to take off their their vinyl off their siding of their house. And they're just like, they don't believe it. So it's just kind of like wonderful to see documentaries that aren't just all doom and gloom, which I don't think, you know, Queen of the Sun isn't just doom and gloom. There's like all these hopeful aspects. For me, you know, I can't help but think of sort of the classic example of, and it's not so much of a saving the environment kind of film, but just the old National Geographic films hmm. about lions or safaris or whatever. I remember those capturing my imagination when I was young in a much different way than any other film you'd see, you know. Um, in the sense that it was like using film, you know, me sitting in front of my television to grow my appreciation for the environment, for nature and the natural world. And I still find those kind of, you know, in some ways they're very simple films. They're often very elegant and beautiful and sometimes overly simplistic. But I, I still find those as great ways to like reconnect, you know, and it's like you don't want to get too political all the time. You, you got to like have those times where it's like, watching just how incredible different animals are you know whether it's the planet earth or you know these the newer movies too that are coming out and and also i remember a movie that we talked about in the edit room a lot was herzog's encounters at the end of the world where he finds this balance between like philosophy of what it's like to be in on antarctica you know uh, from different people but also just like the beauty of the ocean underneath these ice shelves you know something you'd never think of it's kind of that same sense of hidden beauty and then tapping into like the philosophy of one penguin walking off into the distance, you know, and like, what's he doing, you know, and just like the, the human thought behind it. So it's mm. fascinating. 